before I was invited. I didn't know that I was going to read a book that would tell my life. The book was very much about black men and the stories around black men. And sometimes those stories are tragic. For example, I didn't know that in this book it would talk about issues that I've come very familiar with this year. I lost a father in May. I lost a brother in January and a grandfather in February. That part of the story of Ame's book is a narrative of revelation. And part of that narrative of revelation is that the story that black men are telling deals with the stuff of life. And the stuff of life deals with the tragedies that we face often. And part of those tragedies is death. And so I thank you, Zarina, because for me, the book was in many ways therapeutic helping me to make sense of things that before didn't make sense to me. I didn't understand why Derry got shot. I didn't understand why my father, a very young guy, died too soon. I didn't understand why my grandfather, on his way home from his last concert, is a blues singer, so dead in an accident. By reading some of the narratives, some of the criticism around the narratives, the ways that black men, not just through a literary imagination, but through a social and cultural imagination, gets constructed in the ways that that imagination reproduces our very real stories, helped me to begin to understand. My work deals with understanding black men and their ways with words, and taking their ways with words in some ways seriously. I've looked at the things that, for instance, young black boys, you know, right. Well, some of you might ask, well, 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 why is this important? Because part of the narrative that Ame's book is talking about is that, that, that the stories, the revelations around black men and black masculinities aren't necessarily humanized. That is, and I'll, I'll, put, I'll put it in the context of my work, and when I talk, um, about black males and literacy, young black boys and literacy, the conversation is usually how do we get them to read and write? How do we get them to tell their stories? Ame's book tells me that they're telling their stories. And it also says that we have to listen. And that in that listening there's therapy. In that listening there's revelation. We've used really interesting adjectives to describe that type of young man. Part of the description is this, this adjective of disengage. Disengage writers and readers. But it seems to me, reading the stories of Bigger Thomas to Biggie Smalls, the stories of um, Ellison to, to Tupac, or, or the stories of um, D'Angelo, that they're not disengaged, that, 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 that these young men are very engaging, that they're very much telling their stories. And the occupation seems to be that we're not necessarily engaged in listening. What is a book that engages us to li listen? I want to make three large points around that notion of listening. And reading Ame's book, what do we listen to? What do we listen for? One point is this idea or question about what does it mean to be a man? And that's a question that runs throughout the book that he comes back to over and again through each chapter. And then one of his answers is that masculinity in some ways gets twice pluralized. That there are many versions of black masculinity. And those versions splinter in terms of black sexuality and black participation in the universe. And yet, the larger cultural conversation, social conversation, fails to see the complex masculinities that black men perform daily. The second form of um, pluralism is the ways that Black masculinities exist within the singular black male body. 
from black sexualities and the gays, and I'm thinking about the chapter on D'Angelo, to notions of black peace, black love, and black violence, and how they compete for space within the same dark black body. The ongoing competition, Du Bois's, more than double consciousness, multiple consciousnesses at work. Another aspect of the book is in some ways about, you know, taking black manhood seriously then. Understanding black men outside of a larger narrative, dominant narrative of, you know, tragedy and crisis, but of one of humanity and complexity. And this narrative begins with a place of respect, a respect for black male lives, for black male existences, and the ways that black men write those lives and write those existences. That leads to the second point. So if we're gonna respect the ways that black men write those lives, write their existences, we also have to take seriously where they choose to write and how they choose to write them. It was beautiful to see this relationship between old and new literatures. It was beautiful to see um, the classical African-American you know, um, tales of, of Bigger Thomas in conversation with Biggie Smalls. Because as we've grown and as we fought to you know, have African-American literatures accepted and respected within a, the academy, the conversation the book says to me doesn't stop there. It continues. It continues to uh, places of appreciation for new forms of writing. And this isn't new, right? Because if we think about like the, like, like the underground literatures of the day, the hip hops that, you know, um, not Ami explored, but, but, but of, that literary critics explored. His work is very much in league with traditions and language and culture studies. I'll give an example. I was talking to a colleague today, and he reminded me that before Chaucer wrote, when Chaucer wrote Canterbury Tales, he didn't write it in the language of domination. He didn't write it in the language of colonialism that part of the artifact of writing, part of the artifact of literature, the literature that we take seriously, was uh, anti-colonial anti activity. He wrote it in the language of the street. He, he wrote it in the language of the tribe. And we have other people, Dante, and even Shakespeare. And the list goes on. And so, Another ethic that translates throughout the book is taking the stories, these really incredible, appreciated stories that are not just flexible, but also fluid and constantly constructed and co-constructed among black men, talking about their multiple masculinities that in some ways get twice pluralized. The third point. The third point moves us toward New theories of masculinity. New theories of black masculinity where we don't necessarily resolve the questions about what does it mean to be a man, yet we push those questions forward. What do it mean to be a man's, plural? Not just men, right? A man's? And have that appreciated and situated across bodies and within bodies. So for me, the work was an intellectual achievement. An achievement that exercised the ghost of my father, my grandfather, and my brother. An achievement that is helping me to resolve and explain questions around black masculinity that I quibble with today but an also an intellectual achievement that bridges the borders of new theories, 
new understandings for how we can look at ourselves, record ourselves, talk about ourselves, and bring about a new conversation around manhood, blackness, and being. Thanks. <laughs>